Okay. Got it. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the front line with Joe and Joe. Joe Pasillo, as always, joined by Joe Resinello. And once more, dear brothers and sisters, let us go into the breach on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network, 1350 on your AM dial, 103.9 on your FM dial, spreading the truth of the Catholic faith to the New York City metropolitan area. Two things, please, as always, we ask you to download the app, the Veritas app, share it with your friends. You'll have access to all of our station's content. We are an EWTN affiliate, so you don't just get uh, all the original program, but you also get everything from EWTN. Hey, if you like what Joe and I do, we mix it up. Up on social media um, at uh, on multiple sites, so you could find us. Primarily, we'd like for you to help us on Rumble and Twitter, but we're also on YouTube and Facebook until, of course, YouTube and Facebook take us down, which I'm sure is coming very shortly because they don't mm -hmm. like when you spread the truth of the Catholic faith to the New York City metropolitan area. So help us out wherever you can. So um, just before coming on, I mentioned to our guest that we're speaking to today, we have Joseph Julian Gonzalez and Monique Gonzalez. And uh, they've written a new book uh, out from Sophia Press. We always ask you, please buy the book from the publisher. Let's support our Catholic publishers, Catholic bookstores, along with our Catholic authors. Uh, Guadalupe and the Flower World Prophecy, How God Prepared the Americas for Conversion Before the Lady Appeared. Joe, I think this is right up our alley. What do you think? Oh, I would say so, Joseph. That's right. I think more I, I I wish more Protestants and atheists would would look at the 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 miracle of Guadalupe and uh, and understand just how profound it is and how 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 it, it converted so many people. And it's like we're, we're going to get into um, in this conversation. So uh, this is going to be a great one. Let me give a quick bio. <laughs> Joseph Julian Gonzalez is a composer for award winning films, TV shows, stage productions and concerts. His music's been performed at Carnegie Hall, the Sydney Opera House, Walt Disney Concert Hall, the Vatican and other prestigious venues. Um a the Walt uh, excuse me a thirty year Hollywood veteran Gonzalez composing credits include the Academy Award nominated feature documentary Color Straight Up the Emmy Award winning Made Gonzalez has studied classical voice with various notable vocal instructors including Alfred Binod she has been a professional cantor at several prominent churches in LA New York City and Ann Arbor Michigan she's worked in marketing and promotions for various Catholic apostolates including U Magazine Legatus Defenders of the Catholic Faith and Ave Maria Radio she has racked up sizable credit list as music editor and score production coordinator for several movies and feature documentaries so Joseph Julian Gonzalez and Monique Gonzalez Welcome to the front line with Joe and Joe, our friends. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thanks for having nice us. Nice to meet you. Looks like we're no. Joe, 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 and, and Mo today. That's we good. I love them. it. That's good. We should say a prayer to St. Joseph and get him in the mix, too. Yes. <laughs> All right. So with that, this is, like I said, I mean, this is right up our alley. I wish more people would, would really pay attention to Guadalupe and everything it means. But that's why you guys are here. So we're yes. going to bring that message out and we're going to blast it on Veritas and all over social media. Joe Resinello, let's get rocking. Guys, we always begin with a prayer to Our Lady in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember, O oh, most gracious Virgin Mary, never was it known that anyone who sought your help or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly into you, a virgin of virgins, our mother. To you we come, for you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O oh, Mother, the word incarnate, despise not a petition, spit in your clemency, hear and answer us. Amen. Amen. Our Lady of Guadalupe. Pray for Pray us. Pray for us. But before right. we get into the topic at hand, uh, Joe, specifically, as Joe Pasillo was reading your bio, I noticed you worked for the Bulgarian National Radio Symphony. I bring that up because I used to work with Bulgarians. Oh, really? And when I was with Morgan great. Stanley, not with them anymore, but I worked there. Anyway, so. It's a great, great country. Wonderful I went place. to a Bulgarian restaurant in Long Island City. Oh, how was and it? And the reason why I bring this up is, I, I mean, Italians, we drink wine. You guys are Latinos. You drink wine. Most, you know, European derived cultures. They drink hard liquor as they eat. I have never in my life this plum yes. brandy as I'm eating dinner. Joe Basile is the craziest dinner I've ever been to in my entire <laughs> life. They're just like pouring yeah. shots of. Joe, like, you never had Johnny stop. Walker Black with your chicken parmesan? No, Come on. No, <laughs> you just eat dinner. Like, like vodka, Europeans, we just eat vodka. dinner. 
<laughs> it's great. It's a great culture. We went to a, a, a an authentic Bulgarian restaurant. We were there. They we, had the, like the throat singer or something yeah, like that. Yeah, the Bulgarian there. music. Like, they had a trio so... there. It was really wonderful. We felt like we were in the world of the the Seven Dwarfs, you know, from the old 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 film, not the new one. But it just just the way it looked. It was it was just a great the people time. Are great. They're so hospitable. you know. We're, I'm sure we're going to get into it in a little bit, but because we're going to be talking about Our Lady of Guadalupe. But there's so many great areas uh, particularly in eastern europe and you look at some mm. of the some of the countries where the catholic faith is vibrant there's a there's a vibrant yes. catholicism and uh but the rest of europe and we're going to get into this <laughs> That's different. the rest of europe needs a visit from our lady <laughs> so it's uh, time absolutely. it's time it's absolutely. about time yeah. and let that bleed over into america joe restinello yeah. So I guess first with Monique, like what attracted you to the, uh, you know, the devotion to Our Lady Guadalupe and then Joseph? Because I, I have one as well. I know Joe Pasol does. So let's start there. I think it's a good grounding uh, jump start. I'll, I'll make it kind of short. I, my, my story has to do with the fact that I was actually very resistant to Our Lady of Guadalupe for many, many years. I had difficulty with the Virgin Mary. So when I converted to Catholicism, it was always like Jesus Christ only for the for the longest time. But um, and I credit Penny Lord for this. I don't know if you know who she is. She is. a Yeah, a, a, I, I used to watch them on EW10, her and her husband. Yes, I know. The yeah. Deal. Yeah, yeah. So what happened was I was friends with her grandson. And one day she pulls me into her office. And she goes, Monique. I believe God is trying to tell you something. You need to uh, behold thy mother. I keep hearing the words, behold thy mother. And she's like, and because of that, I have to give you this book. I don't know what it means, but I think you need to get to know his mother because you can't love him unless you love her. And it, from that point, I started intellectually informing myself. I struggled for a really long time, but around uh, 2006, I had uh, an experience, shall we say, and it was a very deep, healing of some biochemical issues that I had. And it, it was a, a situation of from one day I was immersed in these biochemical issues and the very next day they were completely and totally gone. And I experienced joy for the first time, um, which kind of shocked me. I'd, I'd been a devout Christian up to that point, but it completely flipped for me through Our Lady of Guadalupe. And from that point on, I kind of feel like I'm indebted to her. I have to give my life over to her. And then with, within three years, I met Joseph. And then his, mm. what he's going to start with and what he's going to explain right now is what pulled me all the way in. And it gave me clarity as to why I was healed in 2006. Right. And, and thank you. Thank you for that, Monique. Joseph. Yeah. So my situation with Guadalupe is I'm Mexican-American, uh, you know, raised in the, in the barrio of, uh, of Central California. And in Guadalupe is everywhere if, if if you're raised in that environment. Number one, my, my grandma's name is Guadalupe. I went to Our Lady of Guadalupe Elementary School. I used to sing this song called Las Mañanitas, which is actually written in honor of Our Lady of Guadalupe, Guadalupe, but it's actually kind of the Mexican happy birthday song. So it it, it was everywhere. And uh, but as I got involved in film scoring and moved out, you know, Hollywood and started doing that whole thing. I, I, you know, it, it waned definitely, but what really put the nail in the coffin for me in terms of uh, wiping out whatever faith I had left was because around the early 1990s, I was uh, inspired to write a piece of music, a concert oratorio. And this is directly tied to our book. Yeah, it's so. tied. It's tied. It's tied, part of the story. What happened is that I, I wanted to set Aztec song poetry to music. So I had to get into it. And I started doing a lot of research in downtown LA. That's where I used to live at the time. And I, I found this book called Cantares Mexicanos, Songs of the Aztecs. And I, I opened up the very first poem and I read it. And it was about a singer looking for flowers. And he was hoping to find the flowers so he could put it in his tilma and show those flowers to the lords and princes. And mm -hmm. I was so shocked because mm -hmm. any Catholic who, who knows the Guadalupe narrative can see the similarities right away. And what happened is I turned to the back of the book to see what the author said. I said, gosh, I've never heard about this. And the author said, well, obviously this earlier uh, Aztec flower songs are the source material for a fabricated Guadalupe narrative. This is the way that the Spanish did this. 
they 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 used things from mm -hmm. the culture in order to manipulate and dupe the indigenous, right? And this was used as a proof text by a lot of secular scholars to to show people, ah, this is all fake. This is all made up. So, and it affected you. It affected me, but just basically, I thought, whoa, this is the smoking gun. This is. I actually thought this is the way they did it. This is the way they do. This is the, the way indigenous. they duped everybody. So anyway, I, I I did a little bit of research at the time, and then I I. I thought, gosh, this is uh, okay. Let's just set this argument aside. It's a little bit yeah. too much for me to handle right now. But anyway, so, so now we fell we can, away. We've I fell away, but it connects when Monique and I met in two thousand nine with her faith journey and then ours meeting. So, so the the way it bounced over to me is Joseph hadn't been practicing for a while, and then he had a massive reconversion in two thousand eight, right, right before he met he met me. So when I met him, we knew immediately. And he that we're gonna get married. And we're gonna get married. And he hired me as his assistant. And this is important because what happened as part of I hired hired, her, hired <laughs> me. <laughs> he um handed me the book of the Cantadas Mexicanos because Carnegie Hall at that time had invited him back to do the entire Misa second. He wanted to add a couple more movements. He's more like, okay, sections to more it. sections to it. So he hands me the book of poetry and says, okay, can you help me find some more poetry to build these songs off of? So of course I go to the very first poem and what do I see? This story that sounds just like Our Lady of Guadalupe. I'm like, oh my gosh, what is going on here? So mm. I pull him into the room I'm like, did you see this? He's like, oh yeah, flip to yeah. the back of the book. <laughs> And so I read I read what the author had to say. His name is John Beerhorst. John Beerhorst. But as opposed to how Joseph took it, I, I guess because I'm a convert, because of the way I came in, my mentality was, oh, well, here's an opportunity to see how God actually used this. And maybe they're just misinterpreting it. So that moment spurred on a 14-year journey of intensive research to find out what exactly what happened. What's going on? Why is... Why is anybody talking, talking about, about this? this? Why are these two accounts so similar? Is it really true mm -hmm. that the Spanish were using this to dupe the indigenous? And, we and thought, I didn't believe it, but yeah. But in my experience, like God can handle the hard questions. Mm -hmm. He can handle us throwing, so to so to speak, the kitchen sink at him because mm -hmm. th there is an answer if we just if we just dig. And so that's the right. fruit of Guadalupe and the flower. So we, so we called it our wonderful obsession. Yes. And in between doing movies, you know, working on movies, working on TV shows, we said, okay, we're going to get to the bottom of this because this is just too weird. And I know we're giving you a really long answer, but no, no, I love I've it. never heard we of love it. it. This is interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the reason, I, because you're, you're asking about our, our devotion and our faith journey with Guadalupe. But it's all centered it's all around tied this. Because for me, I, I needed to know proof. I needed to actually see it in front of me. And as we did more research, and I mean, we did lots of research. research. We went to libraries. We ordered books. We actually sure, we went to conferences, Mesoamerican conferences. We a lot we met a lot of these um scholars. You know, PhDs and scholars that we were actually reading about. And we had discussions with them. Some of them we actually filmed. That's another story. But eventually, if you add what we're what we call the flower will prophecy hypothesis to this, it we came to the conclusion that it is impossible that the Guadalupe story could have been fabricated. In, there, in there's, fact, right. In fact, that's part of our premise, and I'll just say it right now, that the Guadalupe flower world prophecy, we're saying that the four days the, when Guadalupe met Juan Diego in December 1531 was not an isolated event. It actually was the culmination of 3,000 years of evangelical preparation. So to finally answer your question, for me, and I guess for both of us, is that we saw this great miracle that happened yes. and it, it really <laughs> deepened my faith, even though I had converted and I thought, gosh, it cemented it. it cemented it. And, and now, you know, of course we're open to perhaps other information, but I can't see how it is. We have read everything there was, at this point. <laughs> well, I think we've read pretty much everything. Uh, <laughs> we, it, it, it just, it is just impossible. And, and what it is showing is a grand meta narrative. Yes. It's showing how God's salvific plan played itself in the Americas. So perhaps yeah. I'll conclude with that. On that part. Well, let me let me ask you this: If you're just joining us, Joseph Julian Gonzalez and Monique Gonzalez, we're, they're here discussing their new book on the front line with Joe and Joe Guadalupe and the Flower World Prophecy: How God Prepared the Americas 
for conversion before the lady appeared. I'm going to hand it over to Joe to talk about the, the, the prophecy itself, okay? Because I know Joe and I, our audience, really want to know about that. But I will say this. You mentioned this idea of the, it might have been fabricated and and God, uh, you know, works in the way God does. Go look at the tilma. <laughs> go go look at the research that's been done on the thing that's still there that shouldn't have been here, shouldn't be there 500 years later. I hate to sound get get all animated mm -hmm. about it, but sometimes I would like to say to atheists and Protestants, by the way, go look at the tilma. Go hire your own scientists, go in there, go take a piece of that tilma, and go and research it because the research has been done. Leaving yes. aside the the the, the mind-blowing interpretation of the image itself and how it spoke directly to the indigenous people of Mexico, which we could get into later on if you mm -hmm. want. Just the idea that the, 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 the pigment isn't even touching the cloth. There's a separation that, that it shouldn't exist. Those, those flowers, the Castilian flowers, they're not part, they're not from that part of Mexico. All of it, you say to yourself, it's still there. You're welcome to go totally. and take a look. Mm -hmm. I love a quick comment for, from you. Then we'll hand it over to Joe to talk about the, the prophecy. Well, actually, that leads into what we're going to be talking about, because what we what you just said about the tilma and how incredible it is, what we're saying is that that's actually just the tip of the iceberg. And there's a massive mm -hmm. <laughs> hundreds of miles that are beneath it. And that's what this book is about. And to kind of start from the beginning well, so we can but, bring but people look, into what we're. Yeah, let me just know. quickly let me just quickly um, just comment it's on part that. Of a larger network. Of yeah, ideas. yeah. What we're it's saying is that if, if you add our, our hypothesis to it, we see that there's a, a larger net, network of artistic, artistic ideas. ideas. It's not okay. only just the image of Guadalupe, mm -hmm. but it also deals with song and poetry. Mm -hmm. And not only that, you see the implantation of concept and ideas dealt in pottery shards. And so it was It was on pottery. It's, Archaeological on, it's digs. on murals. It's actually uh, depicted in monuments. So we're saying, we're saying that all this preparation led the indigenous in one direction. And that was to mm -hmm. Christian conversion mm -hmm. through the, the fulfillment of the Guadalupe event, which of course mm -hmm. includes the Tilma. And and as part of well, the network Joe of want, Joe, oh sorry sorry Joe no no go ahead Monique go no ahead. please yeah please I want to I'm listening yeah. I'm we always okay. learn I'm fascinated okay so uh, as part of this larger network of ideas is the Guadalupe story itself the narrative and that's what our book is centering in on yes. was the narrative so starting from the beginning of the Guadalupe story when Saint Juan Diego is ascending the Tepeyac. Did you want to say something? Well, I think Joe wanted to direct the. No, the, no, that's okay. No, he's he, he, he just went back. Yeah, it's oh, great. Okay. 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 So for, at the very beginning of the Guadalupe story, when St. Juan Diego is ascending Tepeyac Hill, he finds himself swept into a paradisal realm, saturated with iridescent light coming from everything, this beauty and this music. He's surrounded by the music. And he's so startled by this, he exclaims, and this is an important line. It seems like a throwaway, but it's not. It's actually the beginning of something huge. Where am I? Could I be in the place our ancestors spoke of, the flower world paradise, the land of heaven? So with these very first words, he's tying the Guadalupe encounter directly to an ancient indigenous belief system of a solar and floral paradisal realm that ma that actually matches what he's experiencing. And it's called flower world. Right. And it's it's called flower world by arc by actually it was coined by a linguist, um, which spurred further investigation into archaeology. So this okay. flower world concept is is basically um it saturated ancient Mesoamerica. And, and that was a belief system of an afterlife filled with music and beauty. Okay. So um, what the time period that we're talking about is around 1500 BC. This would put it in the middle formative Olmec period. The Olmec is considered the first civilization of the Americas. This is where you begin to see these concepts start to uh, begin to blo uh, blossom, yeah. if you want to say, the, the the concept of a maize field or corn field that's filled with beautiful birds and become, butterflies and, and yeah. butterflies and and plus it gives you sustenance. This became the concept for this flower world paradise. So in the Nahuatl language, that was the language that was spoken between Guadalupe and Juan Diego. 
the term is in Xochitlalpan, Tonacatlalpan. Okay, <laughs> try to remember that. We'll just keep referring it to it as the flower world paradise. Okay, so what is happening is that this concept, as we're saying, it, it dates back to 1500 BC, and we see it progress over the centuries mm -hmm. until- it's growing and developing, growing and it's developing. It's growing and developing, eventually is reflected in the song poems that we were talking about. So 1500 AD, around the time when the when the Aztec culture and the, and the Spanish clashed, we see about a 3000 year development of, of concepts. And just to kind of get to a point here is that in 1490, just a few decades before Guadalupe appeared in 1531, these poets got together and started, these warrior kings came together. In, and, in between the bloodshed and the fighting. Right, and talked about this flower, these flower song poems. And one of the things that they came up with is that the flowers mean the only truth on earth. And eventually we see how it connects to the Guadalupe story because Juan Diego gathers the only truth on earth in his tilma. So um, anyway, so uh, well, just, do you want to talk about flower hypothesis anymore? Do you have any questions or anything? No, actually just, what I want to just kind of talk about, because I didn't know that actually, like clearly God used this image and it resonated with the people. And you're talking about how this has been going on for quite some time. Talk yes. a little bit about what was happening in that culture. Um, mm. There was human sacrifice. Uh, yeah. This is not my, you know, opinion. This isn't like me pointing no, fingers. Not. This is just what was happening. Uh, Mel Gibson made a, a movie about it, Apocalypto. Mm -hmm. He, you know, mm -hmm. it kind of lays it all out. I don't know how accurate that is. I'm not a historian, but I do know that took place. And Our Lady of Guadalupe was an image of a person during that time clearly Juan Diego could relate to her she was pregnant she wore and again I'm not an expert you are the expert you tell me her outfit was that of a person uh in that culture talk a little bit about that because I think it paints the backdrop before the miracle takes place we talk about Juan Diego oh boy where can we go with this well, well, let, well let, let me talk about human sacrifice just for a second okay um See, to tell actually, we don't really talk about the tilma. In fact, we 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 bring the tilma uh, just just in reference to a couple of of things, and and that may shock people. <laughs> and but there's oh. a reason for that, though, and it's because in order to understand the tilma and the millions of conversions, you have to understand the story. And before you understand, in order to understand and the story, world you have world. to understand flower world. You have to know that there's a multitude of characteristics of this flower world system that is shown in pretty much everything they did. They were actually a very sophisticated society. They had mandatory schooling for uh, for quite for a few sure. centuries where they're forced to memorize these ancient song poems. Did they have 57 genders lexicon. like our society? Not at all. No, okay. So then they <laughs> were more sophisticated than us. Just wanted to throw Absol that out there. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. But see, just, Joe, you're such a troublemaker, trick. Joe. You're such a troublemaker. <laughs> you had to go. You had to go there. But it is tied in. This whole concept of flower world is woven into all of this, even the flower world aspect and the human sacrifice. Yeah, let, let me, that's the only and yeah, let, let, let me let me show you. Let me just show you quickly. So Flower world, you know, as we say, it's 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 ancient Mesoamerican man's yearning for this paradisal afterlife, okay, and eventually comes reflected in the song poems. So the thing is, is that this belief it was we make the case that it was really kind of manipulated by the by the elite. Who does it was that, actually you know? became a justification for war and human sacrifice. Which, which I, if I can in, uh, input a quick little historical point, the massive human sacrifice that everybody has heard about was not a normal part of their, of their landscape until about 1450, because the massive famines and plagues were starting to wipe off the population. And so somebody stepped into that gap in the power gap and used the flower world belief system to kind of impose this these these actions. Yeah, let, can run with let me let me just try to give you a quick overview. In 1427, this is really 1427, 1428. This is really the rise of the Aztec Empire, the so-called Aztec Empire. The immediately the Aztecs, or better yet, what they were called the Mexica, they started a process what they call the Flower Wars. 
it, and it's based on the premise that I just gave you, that essentially warriors who would die in battle that would spill blood, or if you were sacrificed, it was like a win-win situation, whether you were on kind of the, the losing end or the whatever, if you died in battle, you would go, turn into a hummingbird or a butterfly and you would go up to the flower world paradise. So flower world concepts were playing in the background of the bloody sacrifice. And just to let you know, in 1450, there was a big ramp up of, of tens of thousands of sacrificial yes. victims set, up, set about by this one Mexica leader named Tlaca Alal. He's and, kind of like a Rasputin type character. Right. And it start, it ramped up really to an extreme degree in 1487 with the dedication of the temple to the war god, Huichilipochtli. So by the you time say you about 80,000 people were sacrificed at that point. Yeah, 80,000. Yeah. So between 1487 yeah. and when the Spanish first arrived in 1519, you see a huge uptick, uh, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of sacrificial uh, victims occurring during that time period. So, so anyway, so yeah. What you so, say? so kind of what I was going to go through it, you know, we're seeing all of this human sacrifice, but the reason why he was able to, uh, how do you say, get that many people to be sacrificed is because he's piggybacking off of a very essential point in the Nawa uh, cultural lexicon, which is the idea that you cannot go to this flower world paradise if you are unworthy, and in order to make yourself worthy, Tlaka Olel steps in and says, the only way you can be made worthy is through the sacrifice of your blood. But that wasn't how it started out. The way it started out is actually at the heart of our book. And if you can jump into right. the okay. ancient song poem. Okay, so... Which, which is, there's this ancient song poem that exists. It's called the Kwika Pekayot. And the translation of that is origin of the songs. It's the first of the songs. It, it's what influenced all other songs. And within that story is a narrative of a singer who wants to gather flowers in his tilma from a, from a place called Shoshit Lalpan Tonakatlapan, the flower world paradise, in order to bring it down to the princess. Did you want to right. that? Right, so he want, what the narrative that is, that is set forth the singer wants to gather truth okay ultimate truth in his tilma so he could show them to show him to the lords and princes however the way that the narrative go is that the singer doesn't actually find the flowers the singer is not allowed into this flower world paradise because he's full of sin he's afflicted he's sinful and he's not worthy so he laments and he says i wish i could go to this flower world paradise and he says, he speculates at the very end of the poem, he says, perhaps the far, the God of far and near, and the Nawat term for this is Intloke Nawake. So if you could try to remember that, the God of far and near, Intloke Nawake. Only the God of far and near can make one worthy to enter the flower world paradise. Okay. So I'm just gonna if, if you put that story and all of a sudden we go into the Guadalupe narrative. The older song ends on the on the question of worthiness, right? Who can go to the flower world paradise? And what I, makes you worthy? Right. I can't go. And the singer, the, the main protagonist in the earlier poem, he is saying that he can't go as a representative of, of his people. Only in Tlokanawake can make one worthy. We go into the Guadalupe narrative. How does it open? Joseph. It, Yes. We're going to hold that thought. I apologize. Sure. We have to take a quick break. How does it open? That's what we're going to pick up right on the other side of the break. You're listening Thanks. to The Frontline with Joe and Joe. We're so overjoyed to be joined by Joseph Julian Gonzalez and Monique Gonzalez to discuss their new book, Out from Sophia Press. Please buy it from the publisher, Guadalupe and the Flower World Prophecy, How God Prepared the Americas for Conversion Before the Lady Appeared. Stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Frontline with Joe and Joe, everyone. Joe Pasillo, Joe Racinello. We're way in the breach on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network. We're discussing the new book out from Sophia Press, Guadalupe and the Flower World Prophecy, How God Prepared the Americas for Conversion Before the Lady Appeared. We're joined by the authors, Joseph Julian Gonzalez and Monique Gonzalez. So just five seconds, Joseph, uh, let us let our audience know where you left off at the end of the uh, at the end of the last segment and then pick it up from there, please. Right. We were talking about the old, older flower song poems, talking about who gets to go to the flower world paradise, what makes one worthy 
And from there, we, we can now segue into the Guadalupe narrative, the narrative that everyone knows and loves. So that's a summary of where we were. So uh, going into the Guadalupe narrative. So as the other other poem ends on worthiness, when we go into the Guadalupe story, when when Juan Diego comes into the in, in uh, passes Tepeyac Hill, as Manique was saying, the first thing he says is, he says, "Where am I?" He actually, well, actually, his first words is, um, "What is it that I hear? Am I worthy of what I hear?" So he actually connects worthiness to being in this flower song poem. And then, of course, as we said, he says, could I be in the place that our ancient ancestors spoke of? Why would he say that yes. unless he already had knowledge of the flower world paradise and that it was connected with worthiness? Yes. So he goes to this place and, and he, as a commoner, as a humble commoner, was not supposed to be in the flower world paradise. That was only reserved for the warriors and the, mm -hmm. and the sacrificial victims, as we were talking about. So it it it's 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 the background story. So we so when he comes in, uh, it would have it would have meant something to the the people who would have heard the Guadalupe flower song, as it the, the story as it would have spread throughout Mesoamerica. That Guad that excuse me, Juan Diego as a baptized Christian entered the flower world paradise. That's the difference. And, and that's hugely significant because the ancient singer is never able to go into this flower world paradise because he wasn't worthy. And then at the opening of the Guadalupe account, it starts with Juan Diego saying, am I worthy to be in the flower world paradise? So it perfectly dovetails. Right. And and now <laughs> when we say this to people, it sometimes blows people mind, mind minds. Okay, so... In the earlier poem, it says only in Tlokanawake can make one worthy. Mm -hmm. Okay, in Tlokanawake, mm -hmm. the god of far and near. Well, when Guadalupe addresses herself, yes, tell us about that. So when Guadalupe introduces who she is, of course, she says, I'm the mother of the one true God. But the very next thing that she says is, I am the mother of Enthloke Nawake, the God of far and near, the exact same God that's mentioned in this very first, this very first God poem, attribute of, this God. attribute of God. And she says a, a, three other indigenous terms that are tying her to the ancestral traditions. But the fact that she starts with that one is pretty mind blowing, because what it's saying in the indigenous mind, that if in the indigenous mind who hasn't converted yet, if Nthloka Nawake makes one worthy, and Guadalupe is the mother of Nthloka Nawake, and the priests are telling us that Guadalupe is Mary, who is the mother of Jesus Christ, therefore, Nthloka Nawake is the, is the one who's going to lead me in the flower world paradise, and the only way to do that is through baptism. Right, so the connection would be here is that Jesus Christ is is God is the one supreme God in Tlokanawake. Now, I just to make clear, in Tlokanawake is not a paganistic polytheistic term. Mm -mm. In fact, the Franciscan friars themselves used in Tlokanawake in order to try to explain the Christian God to the indigenous peoples. We're not talking mm -hmm. syncretism or anything like that right here. Mm -mm. We're just talking about the Nahuatl term for for the one supreme God. Mm -hmm. So the the thing is is that we we make the case that because of the earlier uh, song poem saying that only in Tlokanawake can make one worthy, how does it work with Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus mm -hmm. Christ is the one by his sacrifice opens up, makes it possible for anybody to mm -hmm. get to heaven, to have uh, to, mm -hmm. to 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 live with God for eternity. So through his blood it's sacrifice, through his not, blood sacrifice. Not theirs. That it, that that it opens and erases this barrier between man and eternal life. So we're making the case that, um, and, I, and it, we're making the case that it was through beauty. It was actually through beauty and through the flower that Jesus Christ becomes the flower of truth. Um, there's there's a lot of we're, we're just giving thumbnails right now, mm -hmm. but this is just one aspect that we've been talking just about one. the flower of paradise mm -hmm. and the flowers there's many other uh, connections but we believe that this is that this is the background story to the narrative and of course the tilma is it's is a part of that narrative. is a part of is a part of that narrative 
but we're talking that it was it's tied into song poems it's tied into mural painting all this mm -hmm. other stuff that we were talking about it's absolutely yeah, I'll... it's all absolutely fascinating joseph julian gonzalez monique gonzalez joining us here at the front line with joe and joe please go out and buy their book guadalupe and the flower world prophecy how god prepared the americas for conversion before the lady appeared um let me hand it over to joe we'll keep the we'll keep the conversation going this is Absolutely mind blowing. I, with Joe and I've never heard this. We focus, I think, rightfully because you know the tilma obviously is there. Mm -hmm. We focus on the different aspects of the image that, in and of themselves, you would say to yourself, mm -hmm. "Well, it ain't just a picture of a, of a mestiza." Okay, mm -hmm. um, there's it, it's so far. You mentioned Joseph. You mentioned music earlier. Something I found out recently that the stars are aligned on her on her on her over garment. All right, in 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 musical notes. That when they're actually played and they're perfect on the uh, on the cloth, that that it creates the most beautiful. Like I never heard this before. Leaving all that aside, we never heard of, of any of this. And you want to know what though? When you look how God has prepared other cultures in different yes. ways, okay? Mm -hmm. How is anyone? If you if you have the Catholic mind, which mm -hmm. is the correct mind, um, if you have the Catholic mind, you say, well, yeah, just like God prepared the Greeks through philosophy, yep. God yes. prepared the indigenous yep. people. Of, of of mexico through uh, in a way that that they would listen to him so that's my long with the rant joe resinello well let's talk about the outcome 10 million people convert it's the mm -hmm. largest single christian conversion in the history of mankind that yes. is significant let's talk about that a little bit because ultimately i think our world needs a conversion and if you listen to what you're saying god was sowing seeds while people weren't basically seeing them they were being sown almost underneath the surface of yes. everyday life and then when our lady of guadalupe appear, appears to a very simple person it all clicks 10 million people convert human sacrifice stops mexico is a bedrock catholic country the shrine of our lady of guadalupe is the second most visited church next to the vatican in the world I mean, that, that can't correct. be overestimated. I mm -hmm. mean, like that is like from from a, a culture that was wildly pagan to now a bedrock Catholic country with the church that is visited by as many people Everybody. as those who go to see St. Peter's. Talk about that, because ultimately, I think just in general terms, our country in America is in need of conversion. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, Joe and I are trying our best, guys. We are and have been through this radio station, through other you know forms of catechesis. I always say Our Lady is the atomic bomb. She is the atomic bomb that God sends to the world when the world needs it the most. She showed up at Fatima. She showed up in Mexico. She showed up many Japan, places throughout the world. The Talk about that a little bit, because I think people need hope. I need hope because you can get soaked into all of the troubles that you see that it seems that every time we try to do something good, every time we're taking a step in the right direction, it seems to disintegrate how we need our lady. Talk about that, because I think people need hope. And I think she's America's only hope. Absolutely. OK, I'll start. Um, what we are seeing overall through what we call the Guadalupe Flower World Prophecy is that the details matter, that every single aspect of ideas that were implanted in Mesoamerican culture find fulfillment. I'm just going to give a really quick example. Part of the Flower World Prophecy is that the people who would go to Flower World would go from West, they would follow the path of the sun from east to west. I'm just giving a quick little example. What happens in the Guadalupe story is that the first few times when Juan Diego talks to Guadalupe, he is going from, he's seen, she's in the east and he's looking at her from, from the west, okay? But on the very last day, as you know, when he's trying to sneak around her because of Bernardino, he actually mm -hmm. goes to the east side of Tepeyac Hill. And so when he asks, when he goes, point. this is a key point. When he goes up to the mountain, he's approaching from the east to west to, uh, direction in the same way that the older nobility and leaders, when they went and ascended up the hill to the flower of paradise, he actually mimics it to the T. So the, the, the point of all of this is that every single detail 
is met in order to try to bring the the, the pagan culture to um, to Christianity, and and it it really is a reflection of Our Lady's love for mm -hmm. people because he is constantly directing history, and if he did it for three thousand years up to the 1500s, why is that not happening today? Why is in every single detail that's going on historically around us, why are why isn't God planning something for his glory with preparing us, preparing us in a in a in a certain way? And we we when it culminates, when it climaxes with Guadalupe, everybody knows about, you know, her tender words about what she says, you know, am I, I not here who am your mother, right? I hold you in the in, in the folds of my mantle. We know mm -hmm. that do not worry, you know, here, I'm taking care of you. But when we go into the, um, the account, she is using terms that are so tender. She's using concepts that are so specific to Juan Diego at his age. Because he would have, he bridges the gap of, he would have been trained in these earlier skills. So not only did he know about the flower world paradise, but there's just a quick example. He gives a, they, Our Lady uses a term called in mixed in moyolo. And what essentially what I that means is one. my face and heart. In the earlier school, that was a, a prominent uh, uh, phrase. of education. Because they, it, face and heart meant your character. They were trying to build the character. And and it meant to do with your heart. It meant to do with feel it in your heart. Take what the words that I'm saying into you. This is the way they were taught. And Guadalupe, when she say, my dear son, I appeal. No, knowing your face in your heart. Knowing the words that I'm saying. The words that I'm saying. She's using these words to specifically communicate to Juan Diego and, 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 and to speak in his language and to use his concepts in order to pull him into her and eventually pull mm -hmm. him into Jesus Christ. So uh, th this is the way in which if you go to your mother right now, in these difficult times, she's going to have all the answers. She's going to lead you in the proper direction. Say your mm -hmm. daily rosary. Mm -hmm. Stay close to her because when you stay close to mm -hmm. her, you stay close to her son. Mm -hmm. and, and and when she's saying that, she's going to be speaking in terms that you individually understand and the way that God has created your mind, your heart, we're all a little bit different. Mary and Jesus, if they've done it for the Mesoamerican people for 3000 years, they sure as heck are going to do it for us in today's times. And when all of this happened, a lot of people may not put it in context historically, but the Protestant Reformation was happening in the 1500s. So we have about eight to 10 million people that left the church during this time. And right in the middle of this, Guadalupe is coming in and bringing that, that same number of souls into the church. So as dark as it might seem to us today, I really believe that God's doing something similar. You know, he's, he's preparing mind, us for something. Monique, I, I, I think in my mind, sometimes I've, I've thought in the past that, you know, God sent our lady to Mexico because like you said, the reformation had just occurred and he wanted to make sure Mexico became Catholic and not Protestant. Mm -hmm. uh, before, right. the, right before, let's say the Protestants started, uh, started sending out missionaries. I want to get down to a couple of um, ABCs um, because uh, Joe and I are big on the show. We, we don't like the misconceptions and I'm being charitable. Most of the time they're outright lies. Our lady points us to Jesus Christ. Yes. Period. End of story. Yes. yes. We yes. just recently celebrated All Saints Day. We pray to the saints who are not dead. They are mm -hmm. alive in heaven. Okay. They are praying for us. Our Lady points it. The first person who would tell you not to point to Mary for your salvation would be Mary herself and would right. say, mm -hmm. no, no, it's him. That's what the image in Guadalupe. She's pregnant. The mm -hmm. indigenous people saw it wasn't her, it was the baby. Go ahead, Monique. Oh, sorry. Just to, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just no, wanted please. to piggyback. I just wanted to piggyback off of what you're saying is the image that's directly over her womb. I don't know if you've heard this part before, but it's very specifically a four petaled flower. And that four petaled flower is at the center of this entire flower world belief system. And maybe Joseph can talk a little bit more about that. But in, in this concept of the four petaled flower being an, an, uh, the, the meeting point between heaven and earth. And that's how it was treated throughout Mesoamerican history. You want well, to talk a little yeah, bit well, more about quickly, that? Yeah, well, just quickly. So we have this ancient concept of 
of a flower. Okay, it specifically was it was it's related to this idea of axis mundi, north, south, east, and west, which is the center point reaches up to heaven. So what happened in Mesoamerica is that the four petal, the 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 four directions turn into four petals. It 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 means that through beauty you can reach ultimate beauty. What uh, fast forward ahead. Juan Diego gathers these flowers of truth, the direct connection to divinity, to ultimate truth, and it which point to Jesus Christ. And then in the image, of course, over her womb, we get that same image again of the four petaled mm -hmm. flower. It's just, it's in the in the case of the tilma, it's it's like a two dimensional because it's essentially on a flat surface, but it's it's referring to a multi dimensional reality. A of, portal. It's to a, a portal that that takes us into her womb, which of course connects us to ultimate reality and ultimate truth. But getting back to your initial question quickly, the the what, what Guadalupe has been unfortunately used mm -hmm. as is evidence for syncretism. Mm -hmm. People get this whole thing wrong and I, we just got to put a stop to it. In the account herself, she's clearly is saying, Joseph, I'm sorry, saying, just for yeah. our audience, just for our audience, please very quickly before you keep going, define syncretism. Syncretism is when you take two different religions, blend them together, and come up with a third religion that has aspects of both. Please, that's continue. syncretism. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Okay, so it clearly Guadalupe in the account she is saying, "I am the mother of the true God," and she the first time she says it, she says, "Ineli, ininansi, ineli, uh, teo Dios." She makes it very clear. I'm sorry, it means. I am the mother of the one true mm. God. And then it says it in, she says it in Nahuatl, and then she says it in Spanish, Dios, okay? And then she uses all these different terms to clearly say that she, in the Nahuatl understanding that she is the mother of the one true God. No, this yeah. is an important point because she is not saying, I am a goddess. She's not saying, I am Tonan Sin. I, I'm not, yeah, that's a, a common misconception that people say. They go, oh, well, Guadalupe, she's an Aztec, Aztec goddess. goddess. If she were to have done that, that's the very definition of syncretism. And unfortunately, this is a this is a narrative that's pushed yes. all through Latin America. And, and it's got to be stopped. Because if you believe that Guadalupe is an Aztec goddess, you're just one step away from this concept called Santa Muerte, holy oh. death. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think you know about that. Where they actually Evil. are... are they're evil, praying, evil. the narcos in Mexico pray to this demon, let's just say what it is. To give them success. Right. And, yes. it, you know, and there's other people who who believe this. So it has to be made clear that she's not saying that. The mm -hmm. entire narrative. She never says that. It, it is, 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 it's not syncretism. And, and I think one of the, 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 the best argument, other arguments for this, is that when the indigenous converted, they made an authentic mm -hmm. Christian conversion. They took their idols, they smashed them, they burned them in front of the priest. And these were idols that they had previously hid from the priest. All of a sudden they pulled them out and said, oh, look what we have and we're going to break it because we now understand why we need to do it. There is no indication at all that syncretism was in the hearts of these converts. Mm -mm. They went out of their way to prove to the priests that they mm -hmm. were giving up polygamy, they were giving up slavery, they were giving, giving up their properties. They were giving up properties. They were trying to make restitution to their slaves that they had once held. So they, they, they so they, their conversion, their desire mm -hmm. for the flower world paradise was so strong that they were willing so to give up material comforts and material goods in order to reach that place mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's absolutely fascinating joseph julian gonzalez monique gonzalez are with us at the front line with joe and joe please go out and buy their book guadalupe and the flower world prophecy how god prepared the americas for a conversion before the lady appeared joe we have a little bit of time where do you want to go talk a little bit about how our lady of guadalupe to this very day you mentioned earlier in the first segment how in la in the different communities mm -hmm. the mexican communities that people basically still the image is everywhere. It's similar in Italian circles. Padre Pio, you go to Italy, he's everywhere. Yeah. Talk about how the the devotion is still very strong. I mean, because it clearly is not just in Mexico, but in mm -hmm. all Mexican communities throughout America. Well, I think I'd hazard a guess. It's not just in the Mexican community. It's now throughout the United States. I mean, as people might know, 
you know, the Hispanic population is the fastest growing population in the United States today. So a proper understanding of Our Lady Guadalupe is key because when kids go to university, they're being told, <laughs> if you want to have a rational life, you need to let go of your faith. You need to, uh, and they dismantle Guadalupe. It's the very first thing they do is they dismantle Guadalupe. Right. So, just quickly at that point, you know, it, it's, we've heard stories of people from Mexico. It, it's almost like a, this, the opening scene from God's Not Dead, but true. Hispanic style, you know, and mm -hmm. using Guadalupe saying, if you want, if you believe in Guadalupe, just leave my classroom right now. Right. And so this is happening. We we've heard people tell their their individual stories. And I think we've seen, especially for some reason, in the last five to 10 years, more and more people. I'm, I'm seeing Europeans posting on Our Lady of Guadalupe. I'm seeing people who have absolutely no cultural connection to Our Lady of Guadalupe posting well, Monique, pictures everywhere. Let me ask, Monique, let me ask you a question. I'm not from Fatima. But I'm affected. I'm affected by Fatima. I'm not yeah. from Mexico, but I'm affected yeah. by Guadalupe. I'm not from Japan, uh, yeah. but I'm affected by uh, Akita. I'm not from England. I'm affected by Walsingham. Mm -hmm. the, the, it starts in a small place, mm -hmm. but then as mm -hmm. the message goes out, it mm -hmm. God does that. He radiates it out. Mm -hmm. Christianity was founded in in a very small area of the world, and then mm -hmm. eventually took over the entire world. So yeah, I, I, yeah, mm -hmm. it starts there. Yeah, but the but the message goes, you know, transcends time and space. And, and that it underlines the point of Catholic. What does Catholic mean? It means universal. It's for all of us. It's not limited to any one people. It's for the entire human race. And, and Guadalupe is another example of that. Exactly. And I think right now in this time that we're going through these very difficult times, not only mm. in the world, but in the church, mm. is that prophecy and Marian apparitions seem to be on, everybody seems to be thinking about them these days. And I think that what, what we're providing in our book is that we're saying that this is how it was done in Mesoamerica. This is this is the way that God did it, and this is the way the conversions occurred. And as we said, if it wasn't, it was it was not just happening there. It's happening in our time right now. She's through a Fatima, today, right through through all these the Marian apparitions. Mary is trying to talk to us right now, mm -hmm. and trying to get us to repent, trying to better the world, trying to get us away from. A possible chastisement. So the thing is, is that we we, we need to take these things seriously, and and uh, you know we're, we're we're making the case that it did happen in the past, and it did. Mm -hmm. It's a historical fact what happened. Mm -hmm. Of course, the conversions leading up uh, the Tilma, everything else. These mm -hmm. are historical facts. So mm -hmm. we need to listen to her today. Let me ask you a question. We have a we have a few minutes left. Joseph Julian Gonzalez and Monique Gonzalez. I want to just throw this out to you. You're both Mexican, okay? Um, obviously, you know, you, you, Monique, are you Mexican also? Uh, quarter Mexican, half Filipino. Okay. Um, Mexican. but here's my thing. Religion, the, 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 the conversion of 10 million people, the subsequent, as Joe mentioned, the bedrock, um, uh, 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 religion of, of Mexico it was Catholicism. And some people might say, well, what's happening in Mexico now is just a natural waning of religious belief over time. Um, yeah. Joe and I are not of that opinion. Joe and I are not with the infiltrations of the Freemasons in the 19th century, you, the Cristeros mm. War. Uh, you mentioned the narcos. You mentioned the cartels. You mentioned Santa Muerta. It is a direct attempt, a deliberate attempt to return to its pagan roots. And mm -hmm. the way you do that is you got to get at the church. I'd love both your comments in the last three minutes that we have. I would say to that, you're absolutely right. The Cristero Wars, when Mexico was trying to wipe out Catholicism in the early 1920s, the president of Mexico, President Calles, was a 33 degree Mason. He was very, very anti-Catholic. We believe that what, what they weren't able to do by trying to wipe them out physically through war, it entered academia. And you could you could see anti-Catholicism mm -hmm. all over Mexico City. We, we've been there several times. We know a lot of uh, Mexican of the parts of the intelligentsia. It also it, it, the, the front line though is Guadalupe. And here's why we say that. Yeah, yeah, okay. because bec we're talking about the world being a pagan culture. That's essentially what we're saying. We're living in pagan cultures. I think that's part of the reason why Guadalupe is very popular, even with people who aren't religious, because they're assuming that she's a wonderful. Uh, image of something that's not Christian. And a lot of people are trying to turn it that, turn it in that direction. When we're here to bring it back to center and saying, no, that's not the case. Our Lady Guadalupe there is, is there to pull you away from the pagan world. And she shows, 
and, and she could show you how she is that bridge of understanding that can help resolve a lot of these questions and issues. It, yeah, but it gets all mushed together and, and it's done purposely. It's part of the well, plan. That, but Joseph, that's why we are here at the yeah. front line with Joe and Joe. That's why you wrote your book, Guadalupe yes. and the Flower World Prophecy, how God prepared the Americas for conversion before the lady goes. We're here to unfog all that. OK, exactly. we're here to unmush all that mm -hmm. to put it in North New Jersey terms like Joe, Joe and I do. We're unmushing all that Unmush. by saying, no, 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 we're not defending Guadalupe. We're attacking what you're doing. All right. Because what you're doing Love is spreading it. lies. We have about a minute left. Joseph Monique, tell our audience where they could follow you more, where they could buy the book, anything, any place where they, they could uh, learn more about what you guys got going on. Well, Guadalupe and the Flower World Prophecy is being sold on Sophia Institute Press. It's coming out November 21st, but you can also find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and multiple other platforms. We also are starting a website, www.guadalupeflowerworld.com, and you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and a whole bunch of other. Yeah, just put our names in, you'll find us. All right, and awesome. And, and what we'll do is we'll make sure we blast this out. This... Joe and I both know, I mean, we're a couple of fast talking Italians from New Jersey, man. I mean, we, we could talk for Love a it. long time. We know we could talk to you for hours about this. Yeah. Um, and needless to say, you're stuck now. You're part of the family. You're not going <laughs> anywhere and you have to come back anytime we ask you to. So we can yes, continue anytime. the conversation. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah. We thank you so much for coming. Like I said, it's been an absolute pleasure. We, we're going to, Joe and I are both going to make sure we get the book and encourage all of our audience members to get the book. So thank you both so very much. Thank, thank you. you very it's much. It's been wonderful thank meeting you. you. It's great Absolutely. talking. God bless God you. Bless and you. thank you all out there for joining us here at the Veritas Catholic Radio Network. 1350 on your AM dial, 103.9 on your FM dial. Spreading the truth of the Catholic faith of the New York City metropolitan area. Uh, make sure you download the app, the Veritas app. Share it with your friends. You'll have access to all of our station's content. And wherever you see Joe and I um, on social media, uh, we're primarily trying to build up our Rumble presence, which is going very well and Twitter, which is not going so very well. So get over to Twitter and follow us on Twitter uh, before YouTube and Facebook take us down. And we know that they will. Like, subscribe, share, do all that fun stuff. Thanks once again. And remember until the next time that our conversation is your conversation and that conversation is going on everywhere. We'll talk to you soon.